Our next speaker of the morning is Juanita Caizon, Pinzon Caicedo, who will speak about satellite operations that are not homomorphisms. Is this working? Okay, okay. Thank you, Paolo, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me. It is a huge honor to be a speaker in Tom's uh, birthday conference. Um, Tom's work has been incredibly influential in, in my uh, career. Unfortunately, the topic that I chose for today is not one in which I use a lot of his work, so my apologies, Tom. Thank you. Um, so for the people in the internet, he forgives me. So satellites that are not homomorphisms. So this is a uh, joint work with Ty Lidman and Alison Miller. And for details, uh, you can already find the preprint in the archive. Okay, so, you know, I think that the first thing that I am going to do uh, is define satellites and then what do I mean by homomorphisms. Um, and for, especially for the grad students, uh, you know, this talk, I want you to make the most out of this talk and so if there's a concept that I talk about that I don't define or that you would like some clarification, this is my invitation for you to just stop me and ask, okay? So I, questions are welcome and there's no question that I am not going to try to answer, try. So uh, what's a satellite? I think we already saw it a little bit on Jen's talk, but uh, let me do it again. So let's say I have a knot. Well, this is a funny picture of the unknot, but the thing is that here, what I want is I want to embed it in a solid torus, in an unknotted solid torus in S3. And then I'm going to take any knot, say the trefoil. The trefoil does have a tubular neighborhood around it. And the tubular neighborhood is homeomorphic to a solid torus. So the satellite operation, so this is going to be the pattern. This is the companion. And what it produces is a third knot in which I basically, you know, like I cut this open along this meridional curve. I tie it along the knotted companion. And whatever image of my pattern I get in this new, in this knotted solid torus, that's the satellite knot. Um, there's, we need some twists here because I want this operation to be untwisted, which means that I want meridian to go to meridian, obviously, but I also want longitude to go to longitude. There's another, so let me call this mer or a meridian of the knotted solid torus eta. And the winding number of my satellite operation is the linking number between the pattern, let me call it P, and the meridional. Uh, not the meridional disk, the, the meridian, the boundary of a meridional disk. This, um, this is the definition. So if I have a pattern and its winding number, uh, this is going to give me a lot of information about uh, these functions. So here already I am sort of hinting at the homomorphism, but I have to somehow give you a group from the knots. And so the second notion that I need is the notion of concordance. 
So I have that two knots are concordant. If there exists an annulus, smoothly embedded in a cylinder over S3 in such a way that if I restrict to the ends, then I get the knots that I started with. So they co-bound an, an, an annulus four dimensionally. So the theorem is, this is Fox and Wilner. If I take the set of all knots in S3, and I mod out by concordance, then this is going to be, well, let me call this quotient space C. But what they tell me is that, well, one, concordance is in fact an equivalence relation. And then this quotient is an abelian group with connected sum as the operation. What do I mean by connected sum? So I say I have, again, my trefoil. Why not? And then I can have any knot. Let me be lazy and then just hide it there. The connected sum is remove a little arc from each one of the knots and then identify the ends, okay? Um, then, so just uh, some observations. The class of the unknot, let me say if K is concordant to the unknot, this is equivalent to saying that K bounds a slice disk, or a disk, and so they, these are called um, slice knots. And inverses, so say I have any knot and I want to take the inverse, so what I get is that this is the same as the class as the mirror. So what's the mirror? So for the trefoil, here's my right-handed trefoil, and the inverse I'm going to get by changing all of the crossings. So whatever strand was going above now goes below and vice versa. And it's in this setting that I have my group. So here I have just an operation that goes from knots to knots. But the thing is that, uh, well, basically a tubular neighborhood of this annulus in this four manifold is basically the same as uh, taking a solid torus cross I. So I can actually do this operation at each level in the concordance. And so what I have is that my pattern induces an operation in concordance. Okay. So this, so I want to obstruct these maps from being homomorphisms in concordance. Um, where does this come from? So this is a conjecture of Matt Hedden. Well, I heard it first from Matt Hedden officially in 2016, but you might correct me if you, if you know more about this, this is when I heard about it, is that if we have a satellite operation, then it is going to be a homomorphism only if he is the trivial homomorphism, P is the identity, and P reverses orientation, or is the map that reverses the orientation of the uh, knots. Okay. 
OK. So the way I'm going to obstruct these satellite being homomorphisms Well, there's one obvious one, which I am just going to take for granted, which is I need this knot, meaning when I remove the solid torus, when I forget about this curve eta, uh, I want this knot to be a slice knot. So I'm just going to assume that. And then the next one is I need for any knot, I need the connected sum of its image under P plus it, the image of its inverse under P to be slice. And this is what I am going to use. So this is, this is what we obstruct. Okay. And just in case, sometimes I will refer to this as a pseudo homomorphism. Those who do satisfy this condition, I will call pseudo-homomorphisms. Great. So let me show you as an example that this cable is not a homomorphism. So how am I going to do it? Well, actually, my, the obstruction is really going to come from uh, obstructing three manifolds from bounding simple four manifolds. So what I am going to do is I'm, instead of looking at these knots, I'm going to look at some Q-fold covers of S3 branch along these knots. Why am I allowed to do that? So there's a theorem by Casson and Gordon that tells me that if I have a knot that is slice, and then I have a number Q that is a prime power, then the Q-fold cover of S3 branch along my knot is going to be the boundary of some rational homology for both. So if I show that one cover is not the boundary of a rational homology for a ball, then I am showing that a knot is not slice. That's what I'm going to do. How am I going to do it? There's this wonderful invariant by Peter. Am I going to get it? Did I get it right? Um, so they define for, let's say, so I have, let's say that I have Y uh, rational homology three sphere, meaning a three, a closed oriented three, three manifold that has the same rational homology as the, as the three sphere, similar for the four ball. Um, Uh, then Y is the boundary of a rational homology for ball. If this happens, then there's an invariant D with some spin C structure that is going to be zero. Or if you want, um, if I take, this is, this is maybe the way I'm going to use it. I'm just going to forget about the spin C structures. And the way I'm going to be able to do that is instead I'm just going to define D max of Y to be the maximum of all of these D invariants for any spin C structure. And if you don't know what a spin C structure is, really, they're, I mean, they're going to be featured as, because they, they are required as an input for, for these correction terms. Can you really see here? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, 
so this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with two times the second cohomology of uh, my rational homology three sphere, which, you know, because it is a rational homology sphere, this is going to be um, a finite abelian group, so I can, in fact, take the maximum. And so what I'm saying is, or the way I'm, we're going to use this is that if it bounds a rational homology four ball, then this is going to be bigger than or equal to zero, okay? This is the way we're going to use it. So, if I show that this d max is negative, then I'm showing that this three manifold does not bound a rational homology four ball, and therefore my nut is not going to be sliced. That's the way I'm going to argue. For this particular cable, so this is actually called the two one cable of a knot. Remember the winding number is two in this case. It's the linking number between eta and my pattern. And so I'm going to choose Q to be two because two divides two. So really I want Q to divide double Q. In this particular case, so let me draw a picture of, of, this, um, the, of this rational homology sphere, or the, which homology sphere. So to understand the two-fold cover of the 2-1 cable of any knot. Well, one way is the given by Agbul and Kirby. So notice that here, I have a Möbius band, and this is going to be true for all cables. You see here, this is a Möbius band for all two one cables. Right? And so, again, for any cable, if I am lazy and I draw it like this, if I take the central circle, what Agbulud and Kirby tell me is that then the two-fold cover is the result of cutting this circle in half and then rotating it to the bottom and changing orientation. So this R here means reverse orientation. And then I'm going to put a framing, a framing number here, which is going to be twice um, or the number of half twists that I find in my band. So in this case, I have plus one. So with this description, what I have is that this is one, plus one surgery on K connected sum KR. Great, this is wonderful because we understand surgeries, especially when it comes to d invariance. I mean, I think that Peter and Sultan, even when they define the d invariance, they gave us the following computation. If I have, and by the way, in this case, this is not just a rational homology sphere, but an integer homology sphere. So I really only have one spin C structure, so I don't, I don't even have to take the max, but whatever. So for the two-fold cover of the 2-1 two cable of the 2K, two 2K two, two plus 1 torus knot, this is going to be minus 2K if K is bigger than 0, or 0 if K is less than or equal to 0. And so, what do I have again? So I want to obstruct this knot. From being sliced, I want to show that this is not sliced. What I am going to do is I'm going to do it in terms of the two-fold cover. But turns out that two-fold covers behave very well with respect to connected sum. 
and so do the invariants. So here, the d invariant here is going to be this sum. And what I have is that this is going to be negative 2k plus 0. So if I choose k is bigger than or equal to 1, then the not is not slice. Okay, so it's enough to have one. In this particular case, we're giving you infinitely many. It's an overkill. One would have been enough. So the trifle is just enough. But life is not that good, and not every cover is going to have this very simple form. It's just not going to happen. For example, I think that if you do the three one cable, which means you put one more strand and, and one more crossing between um, the new strand and the next one, you're not going to get surgery. So what do we do? Well, there's a second description of these three manifolds, which does actually generalize to all branch covers, cyclic branch covers over satellites. So notice that here, what I am doing to get my PK What I did was I consider the, the complement of the tubular neighborhood of my three manifold, and then I replace this tubular neighborhood, but this solid torus. So let me call this solid torus the complement of this unknotted eta curve. And so in this case, what I have is that P of K is really going to be in, in this part. In, uh, It does live in this part, right? So here's, let's say, H is that identification between this unknotted solid torus and this knotted solid torus. Um, and I have that I can then represent P in a much, or P of K in a much simpler way. I'm just going to redraw this. What I am saying is, if I replace this component by the not exterior, let me call this E of k, in such a way that the meridian of k goes to the longitude of eta, and the longitude of k goes to the meridian of eta, then in this case, what I see here, what used to be just a non knot, if I replace by a non trivial knot, then this is precisely my P of K. And I want to branch over that. But to be honest, I only really know how to branch other than Agul Kirby that says if you have a ciphered surface, uh, and then they give you an algorithm to construct a surgery presentation for the branch cover. The only other that I, thing that I can do is I can just branch along the anode, right? Because that's just a matter of rotation. Well, I am super lucky that this knot is um, symmetric, which means that I can just basically change the colors. And now this is my eta, and this is my P of K. Again, I am replacing the tubular neighborhood of eta by the node exterior. And now I can actually take the two-fold cover. So I have my crossing here, my crossing here. This is my axis. And now I have to, so again, I am going to be gluing a knot exterior to each one of them, 
right? That didn't change. But now I have to tell you what the glue looks like here. And for that, well, this part is going to remain the same. So this is fine, that checks. But I have to be careful about this identification. I have to know where the longitude goes. And so a longitude here, it's very easy to see. But a longitude here, well, now I have right. So I have to compensate for that right. And so in this case, I would have to draw a curve that looks like this. And so I, have, I need a curve like that uh, in both components, which really is the minus one, one curve on each component. So what I am saying here is that in this case, in the twofold cover, the meridian of my knot is going to go to the minus one, one curve on each lift. So now, notice that here, I am completely describing the branch cover of the satellite by telling you, by giving you two pieces of information, basically. The lifts of this eta curve and the curve, the lifts of this uh, lambda eta, the lifts of those to the cover, which is not the same as the longitude of each one of these eta one and eta two. Great, okay, so why am I bothering describing all of these and taking a long time to do that? Because in the end, well one, as I had sort of mentioned, a similar decomposition is true for all branch covers. So if I have my satellite operation, I have my winding number. So from now on, I'm going to think of my satellite operation in terms, or my pattern, really, as a two-component link. Instead of defining the precise embedding of P into an unknotted solid torus, what I can do is I can give you a two-component link such that one of them is unknotted. So here I have my winding number, and then I want Q prime power such that Q divides W. And so in this case, I know that the Q fold cover over any satellite is going to be composed of two things. I take the branch cover over the slice knot that I started with, except I remove the tubular neighborhood of all the leaves. And because I'm choosing Q to divide the winding number, I am actually going to get Q leaves. So in this case, I have two. And then I'm going to glue in Q copies of my knot exterior in such a way that each one of these meridians is going to go to the lift, the eighth lift of the longitude of my eta curve. And so that's just the same, you know, basically the same as what I am doing here. So how is this going to work? Why am I, you know, like why, why am I talking about this particular example? Well, because in the end, our theorem, which I'm about to write down, is going to follow from trying to massage any one of these branch covers to that one. In what sense? Um, well, first let me write the theorem and then I'll tell you how to do it. Okay, maybe I'll leave that up, why not? So, theorem. So the usual, so let me say the same, well, I have my pattern, I have my winding number, and I have a prime power that divides the winding number. If I have the following two conditions, one, if I look at the linking number in the Q fold cover of P of U of 
any pair of leaves. I want this to be non-negative and not all zero. Two, I want each one of them to be a null homologous knot. Then, my satellite operation is not a homomorphism. OK, so a few comments. This linking number, this is a rational linking number, possibly. You know, I have a rational homology sphere. And so if I have a knot, it's not necessarily going to be null homologous. Um, and if it is not, then the linking number, the linking number between two non-null homologous knots is going to be a rational number. Just as a word of caution, I don't mean the linking form. The linking form collapses all of the integers to the same thing. And I do want to make a difference between, say, negative 1 and 4. So it's not the linking form. It is the actual linking number that is well-defined um, up to isotopy. OK. Uh, in this case, because I am assuming that they're null homologous, these are actually integers. Okay. Questions so far? Any comments? OK. I have 13 minutes to tell you how to prove this theorem. So the, the proof of the theorem basically, so the, let me do the sketch in case I don't finish. So I, I need three steps. Step one. Well, I start with a three manifold that is not a homology sphere. So I am going to do null homologous surgeries or integer surgeries. Along no homologous knots. Sigma, let me say that sigma is over of P of U to get a cobordism that takes me from this sigma with my link eta 1 through eta Q to S3 with another knot, sorry, with another link, well, the Q component link. But what I want is that the linking information is the same. Including the framings. So whatever I have on one side, I want to have on the other side. And then, uh, because, so remember here that I said, for any companion, really the defining piece, you know, like this is constant to all of them. All of them have this piece. So if I have, if, so, sort of like the, the, the idea is if I have a statement about this side, then by just extending it to this other side, uh, I have a statement about all of the covers. And then, because I have a cobordism, then I am going to get a bound. Uh, so then get a bound on B max. OK. Then step two. Like I said, what I want is to get to this point, to this link over here. Well, 
I don't know what these linking numbers are in general, but here I do know that the linking matrix for this knot is going to be negative one, 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 negative one. Right? Where by framing I mean, you know, like this, there's a way of keeping track of which curve the meridian goes to by just uh, having an integer. So I want to, cons to somehow get to that point, except, uh, well, if I start with, if Q is five, then how am I going to go back to this to only two by two? Well, I, I, I'm going to allow this matrix to be a little bit bigger. And then here, I'm going to have just a bunch of zeros. And I'm going to have some unlinks. Or, an, uh, Q minus two unknotted, unlinked component. So here I ha do uh, change the crossing. Yeah. Surgery along. On a knotted negative one frame, a knot. So this gives me a second cobord design. Now from this L to a new L prime, such that now the linking number of this new one is precisely what I have over there. So it's going to be one for one particular pair, say for the first two components. Negative one um, if I mean framing, and then zero for everything else. So basically, I am just changing it so that I get this linking matrix. And so now I have the linking matrix, but I really want to get not just the linking number, but the precise link. And so the third step, involves um, two class for surgeries. To transform S3 with this L prime into now the actual, let me call, let me call these the HQ. So the two first components are uh, hop fling with negative one framing, and then all of the others are zero framed and knots that are unlinked. Okay, good. So this is the sketch. Now let me give you a little bit more information. Questions so far? Anything? Okay. Yes. Yes, so, okay, so maybe I'm just going to start third to first because Danny asked a question about the third one. So, class per surgery. A class per surgery on a three manifold is the result of um, replacing this genus three handle body let me draw it Um, so where are the handles? Let me cheat because 
I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, okay. So, So you, you you just have the handles joining these the, the same endpoints in such a way that they alternate. And same thing here. So I have this with this. I have this front, um, and I have this with this. So there's. Um, I wish I could show you a better picture. I'll... This is the same or equivalently. You replace um, the Borromean links by you do this surgery along these Borromean rings. Or, equivalently, if phi is the element of the mapping class group of the surface of genus 3, um, such that I have a three handle body union, another three handle body along phi. This gives me a Hagar decomposition for this three torus. Then the Clasper surgery or Borromean surgery is the result of, you know, so if I start with any three manifold and I have any uh, handle body genus three, I have it with F with my another uh, genus three handle body, then the result is just replacing these by the composition of this new one. So let me just say that I just, I just change it by in whichever way this, um, This element, uh, this self dimorphism of the surface tells me. And what's important is that well, maybe I'm not maybe it's not clear by this, but if you want more details, I can I can tell you. Because I only have two more minutes, and this is this is not where I wanted to go. So this is an element of the Torelli group of the genus three surface, meaning uh, the induced map on homology is the identity. And so it really doesn't change the homology at that point. And uh, what we have, so let me say, so part of our result, so, you know, so I always do, in each step, I do some topological operation that has a four-dimensional counterpart, and I use that four-dimensional counterpart to get a bound in the D invariance. And so in here, what we have um, is that if I have an element of a Torelli group of really any surface of genus G, um, and maybe here I can just call it M sub phi instead. If M is any three manifold and M psi is the result if I have a genus G Hegar splitting, then I am just going to get 
are bound on the d-invariant by a constant that it depends on the expression of the factorization of phi in terms of the uh, generators of the Torelli group, which has um, bounding pair maps and um, Dane twists. Okay, so basically what happens in the end is by step one, I get that the D invariant of sigma will D max minus the D invariant, actually, and this is the important part. I have, again, I have these operations that tell me, the, the, give me a precise way of changing my link. And so because I have it at, with the link, then I can say that this is true for any companion. It's not just a statement about the, the first one of them all. And then on the other side, well, what do I do? I take the complement of my link L, and then I take that with the union of Q copies of the node exterior, which is exactly the, so I just carry the same gluing that I had, and um, I get bounds in each step. And I am officially out of time, and I didn't finish the proof, but you know, we get one bound here, then I get another bound here, and then I get another bound here, and all of these are independent. This is the key. They don't depend on the companion, so I get to choose. And so then what I have is that then I have the difference between this D invariant and the D invariant of my beautiful spaces that I had here um, that is bounded by some constant. So I can just choose this D invariant to be large enough or negative enough to compensate for the existence of, of the constant. And then I can just choose my K so that I get something negative and then therefore I have non-sliceness of um, the connected sum of P of K with P of minus K. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Questions for Juanita? Yes, yes. Uh, so, um, we start with a factorization of psi. Okay, so let's say that first, so first let's do it for Dane twists. Well, a Dane twist, plus or minus Dane twist, let's say. That's nothing other than surgery. So I already have surgery, and then, you know, like, if I have integer surgery, I have um, the trace cobordism, the cobordism that is induced by attaching the two handle, and then I have, I get a bound um, from that. So that, that's sort of for free. Then what happens if I have a bounding pair map? Well, in that case, uh, is the proof is similar in the sense that what you need to do is just in, in your four manifold, you want to find um, a closed surface um, that sort of contains all of the second homology. And you want to remove it uh, so that the complement is a semi-definite four manifold because then you have bounds for what happens with semi-definite uh, four manifolds or with boundary. And, and basically that's, that's what we do, you know, like we just construct the correct surface. Um, if you have a bounding pair map, then you start with, so bounding pair map means, so say I have something like this and here I have alpha plus, alpha minus, this is a bounding pair map. And so I can, I can construct a surface by taking, say, this side and uh, I take a ciphered surface for these two. 
Um, and then, and then that's the one that I excise, and when I excise that, I get, I get a lot of control, and that's what allows me to uh, get this, right? And so, so, I mean, when I get a tubular neighborhood of this closed surface, I, I, I am introducing a three-manifold into the cobordism, or into the, into the new four-manifold, which is the, uh, Um, circle bundle of Theole number n over a genus whatever surface, and then you just have to be careful with the spin C structures over there and, and the and they bounce on the D invariants for those manifolds. But those have been computed, so. Yeah, so, so the, uh, right, so there's a theorem. We're relying on a theorem that, I mean, it's just not clear. We, a lot of people uh, did work to tell us that if you have an element in the Torelli group of a closed surface, then you're going to be able to factor it in terms of Dane twists along non-separating curves. So, sorry, separating curves. Yes, the opposite. Separating curves and um, bounding pairs. That's the theorem. And so then from there we can go. Yeah. Any more questions? Marco. For this? Um, well, This one, there are formulas. You know, there's a paper by um, Cha and Co. that tell you if, if, if you give me a presentation of the rational homology sphere as surgery on a link, integer surgery on a link, then I'm going to be able to compute the, li the linking number. All that, so there's, that's a formula. But you do have to produce some sort of surgery description. But, if, but you can do it using a cool curve. So that, that one is, is very computable. Um, in fact, I, I kind of want, I think Snappy should be able to do these computations, but I don't know enough about Snappy to, to I don't know what to tell the computer. So if somebody wants to teach me, I will be so incredibly grateful and happy. And then the second one, yeah, the second one is a little harder. Um, but then, in all honesty, we just, we do have, we, we can replace this one by um, either we have even winding number or the order of each one of these curves in the first homology divides uh, W. And, and in those cases, you can also, you also get that it's not a homomorphism. So there's a little bit right there. Palm. If I, so do I need all of these linking numbers to be non-negative? Is it enough to have a lower bound? Um, we, I do absolutely need them to be non-negative because here, when I am changing the linking numbers, uh, if I want to get to this, I have to start with, with non-negative, right? Because what I'm doing here, you know, like in this, this trick just tells me you can go down, right? You can go down a little bit and a little bit until you get to this. So if I start in negative, I'm not going to be able to get there. Yeah. So that yeah, that's a good point. Right. No. No, absolutely not. Right. So actually so so uh, Tom's question is at first, it sort of seems like in my proof that all of these cobordisms are definite cobordisms, and in fact, it is not. So, you know, like, this whole project started because I wanted to use Chern-Simons bounds to, to get this obstruction, uh, but 
to use Chern Simons uh, or instantons, you really need definite manifolds and definite four manifolds. And in our three steps, the only one that has a definite four manifold is this one. So it's just not enough. That's why we had to go to D invariants, because D invariant, you, you, can, you, you get a lot from semi-definite. Sorry? Uh, so from, from discobordism and from discobordism, I can produce a semi-definite four manifold that is going to uh, give me the bound in the D invariant. So, I mean, if you know how to uh, control Chern Simons using semi definite cobordisms, I'm, I mean, or if anybody knows, I, I would just love, I would love to understand how instantons behave under non negative definite four manifold. Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's uh, thank Juanita again.